Welcome to SEA's webinar with Shah Kabir on gaining insights into long-term performance using various DCA tools. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographics of our audience. And so we will start with some polls. So our first poll is, what is your primary discipline? So we're starting to get some feedback. Looks like it's a good balance between the petroleum engineers and the geoscientists. So almost everyone has voted, so I'll go ahead and share those results. Looks like we're about two-thirds engineers, one-third geoscientists. So our next poll is on how many years of full-time experience do you have in the oil and gas industry? So again, it looks like we've got a pretty good distribution between uh, less than one year up to over 30 years experience. Uh, almost all of you have voted. So I'm going to close that poll and share the results. Looks like almost half of over 30 years experience and a good portion are in the 11 to 20 years experience. So then we have one more poll and that's how many years experience do you have with this topic with unconventional reservoirs? So we're starting to get a few responses here. Again, looks like a pretty good distribution. Um, quite a few have no experience, but others have uh, several years experience. Almost all of you have voted, so I'll go ahead and close that poll and share the results. Looks like uh, the majority are, of you are in two to ten years experience with unconventional reservoirs. So before I introduce Shah Kabir, I'd like to remind you today that as the audience members, you're being muted but you can ask questions during the presentation using the GoToWebinar question feature. And we'll cover the Q&A at the end of the presentation. And so let me take a few minutes to introduce um, our topic. This is SCA's webinar series. Shaki Kabir is our instructor today who will be speaking. And he'll be, um, he's an instructor at University of Houston. He has a wide variety of experience in various uh, topics. He teaches a class uh, for SCA that will be offered in February on reservoir management of unconventional reservoirs. And you can register for that class by calling us or emailing us. And uh, we have several webinars that are scheduled um, through December and starting again in January with several other instructors uh, that will be sharing their expertise. And so without further ado, I'd like There we go. Okay. Please take it away, Shaw. Thank you, Susan. Uh, uh, just bear with me for a second. I will have to Okay. Okay, uh, uh good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, SCA webinar, and I hope uh, I don't bore you with details. So what I'll try to do is give you an overview of uh, my experience. So that's I will walk you through uh, my uh, my journey and learning uh, this particular topic, which is of immense interest to me. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll start with the uh, uh, the content of this uh, brief overview, <clears throat> and uh, so that will entail uh, decline curve analysis, uh, 
some examples of red transit analysis, and then uh, the so-called analytical series model. This is a, a new uh, element that uh, has uh, it, it's gaining a lot of interest because its roots are in the uh, in the analytics of uh, a dual porosity model. So I'll show you some some results of that. And then finally, we'll briefly try to address the well grouping issue. As we're well aware that in any particular setting, uh, every operator has to deal with uh, many hundreds of wells. So given that daunting task, it makes a whole lot of sense to be able to group those uh, different uh, sets of wells in a logical form. So I'll give you one of those methods. Uh, there are, uh, obviously there are other ways to uh, to do well grouping. Okay, moving on. So what we'll do is that this is the uh, my journey began and uh, when I joined Hess in 2008, uh, the fall of 2008, and. Uh, so we uh, studied the Bakken uh, reservoir, and the paper is uh, at the bottom of the slide that I'm referring to. So yeah, we had plenty of motivation um, at that point in time because we didn't know much. Because what I primarily saw in the open literature was um, studies dealing with the uh, uh, with gas reservoirs. So as you know, the the gas is much tighter. That's a uh, nano Darcy versus micro Darcy oil. So we have uh, a uh, we have a big difference in terms of raw uh, properties. Um, so we need to understand the uh, uh, to understand the system. We we had very rudimentary type of uh, analytical, uh, sorry, numerical model set up, try to understand their uh, responses, and that helped us to understand the, what the field responses that we were observing. So one of the items of interest was the uh, oil in place within the stimulated reservoir volume, which we call SRV. And uh, because we have to start somewhere, and we know that's not the original volume place, but the per se in the drainage volume, but it's within the stimulated uh, volume. Okay, so some of the methods that we will uh, talk about will include uh, ARPS, uh, power law exponential, and a stress exponential. So whereas ARPS is very optimistic and it was not intended for uh, unconventional plays, but uh, power law and, and, and stress exponential were designed to uh, handle uh, uh, unconventional systems. So. As it turns out, they're there in the uh, polar opposite, whereas ARPS will give you a very optimistic solution, and the power law uh, stress exponential will give you on the pessimistic side. So perhaps the truth is, lies somewhere in between, as they say. And we'll, we'll try to make some uh, observations move, before moving on to uh, the, int I'll introduce you to the new method that I mentioned. Uh, moments ago, and uh, which is rooted in the uh, analytic uh, uh, formulation. Okay, so when we started the study, we asked ourselves a simple question, okay, well there was quite a bit of information back in those days, 2008 and nine and thereabouts, but there's a whole lot uh, that are available for tight oil such as Bach and so what we were probing at that time is that okay um, will the diagnostic tools still work 
and and then the the other uh, the big question that loomed was uh, which prediction method is reliable? Which one should we go with? Do we have the quality data? As you know, if you are dealing with the uh, uh, public database, they have uh, frequency issue, meaning we have data point every production data point every month. So that's not very really helpful. Whereas for the block and play, we had uh, daily uh, measurements because that's in-house uh, information. So we, in that sense, we, we were data rich and, uh, and because it's basically single phase of the production, we could convert the wallet pressure to bottom hole condition and use the red trend analysis and that sort of thing. So in that sense, we were quite blessed. Okay, so we started with the uh, numerical model and we we're trying to uh, show you the well bore in pink and then the, the green vertical are the uh, completion uh, of equidistant, obviously, and uh, from the center. So this is the flow profile, what it looks like during the first couple of days, and then this is the more mature uh, uh, profile, if you like. So that is the so-called uh, SRV that we are alluding to. So that's the similar reservoir volume of the uh, uh, completion. So how does that look like in simplistic uh, diagnostic tool? So where we have plotted uh, uh, inverse of rate and normalized by pressure uh, difference versus material balance time. And what we see is the half slope line reflecting the early time effect, which is just a linear flow that was occurring in the fracture, each of the fracture domain. And later on, this uh, inner, inner slope response is a reflection of the fact that we've seen the total scope of the uh, SRV. So this unit slope gives us the ability to estimate what uh, reservoir volume is within that uh, SRV. Okay, so that's what we just talked about uh, presupposes that we have a transverse frac. So what do we have? A longitudinal frac. And uh, and this is no fantasy because we have had this set of uh, issues when we began completing. So when we have this set of uh, longitudinal frac, then uh, we will not develop the, uh, the inner slope response that will give us the SRV because we don't have a SRV per se. So that's the problem. Okay, so if we take that data and then try to uh, project what the performance would be. So this is the expected ultimate recovery and for 40 years, EOR 40. So as you can see, uh, we get 830,000 uh, stock tech barrels. And uh, whereas ARPS will give us uh, optimistic and which is expected because ARPS turns out to be uh, the uh, it'll have the B factor uh, of uh, two uh, if we have a linear flow dominated system. So so that's way too high. So and then if we go to the stressed exponential model, and I'm not going to get into details here. Uh, the idea of this plot is to generate the n. It's a, it's a basically three parameter model involving uh, complete and incomplete gamma function. So, so this is just to give you uh, an idea that, okay, we had this data generated with synthetic model. And if I just fitted it, the question we posed, okay, can the system, uh, this methodology give us the uh, 
true solution. So we're doing a blind test. And as you can see, it's a three-parameter model, QO, so that will be starting here if we are doing it. And N is something that we obtain from here. And tau is the uh, time constant. So the bottom line is that the simulator result gave us uh, 854 within the stimulated uh, reservoir volume. And uh, this gives us uh, 857. So there is a good synergy, and we felt good about it back in those days. OK, so how about uh, dealing with field data? As you can see, we have uh, the linear flow period, or half slope line, and then followed by inner slope response. And this response suggests that we have, uh, we have to have 40 fracture stages to be uh, for this uh, curve to go up like that. In reality, we had only 10 fracs. So how do you explain it? Uh, that's coming up next. So what happened here is that this is our well, and that's the seismic. So we, um, part of the well, or the half the well, intercepted natural fractures. So that was not factored in, into the uh, that model that I just showed you. So that's the reflection. It's a good news, but that's what we need to understand what we have in the system. So one of the methods that we found very useful was the three million. And um, so let's move on. We can do the red training analysis. So in other words, we are trying to match the rate itself, the, the consequent cumulative production, because that preserves uh, a material balance in the system. And then also we are measuring uh, the measure pressure. So we reproduce all three curves are rather well. And this is the uh, log, log, log. And, uh, but the unit slope response, as you can see, is uh, uh, not that reliable. But this is the half slope and the inner slope response because it was merely curving up. But we have very few data points to uh, lend credence to that assessment. So the oil in place is, is uh, in the ballpark, but it's slightly uh, more higher here than what we got from the uh, transient PI method. Okay, so what if we applied ARPS and uh, power law? Well, ARPS gives you a very optimistic solution as expected, and whereas power law gives us more reasonable number. And uh, So let me uh, give you another example, a field example where this is from the public database where we didn't have any information for the, uh, uh, what was going on in the world board. So what I, I did, I assumed a constant bottom of pressure because I think this is when they uh, installed the sucker up pump. And uh, so, the whole idea of that exercise is that we can ensure that uh, we have the inner slope response on this diagnostic plot so that we can do our interpretation of late time data uh, to estimate the uh, in place volume within the SRV. So, um, so for that system, so we have we can do the ARPS. Again, ARPS will be always optimistic. And then the power law exponential. And uh, stressed exponential is here. And what is worthy of note here is that 
you see how this is evolving, this EOR curve. And as you can see, it is asymptotically approaching the plateau. And that is a reflection here is that uh, do we need to produce for that long to get there? So we can make realistic economic assessment. How long does it take to what the actual uh, life of a boil? So we are already 300 and it doesn't we don't have to wait 40 years to get to uh, 303. You can make your own assessment uh, for a given situation. Okay, so quickly, the, some of the observations and the lessons that we learned with the, the RTA tools, the red trend analysis tools, uh, helps us to estimate the in place volume within the uh, stimulated reservoir volume. And uh, so we didn't, sorry, we didn't talk about CRM, so I'll, I'll forget about that part. So we have the stretch exponential provides the lowest estimate, whereas ARPS gives the highest power law method closer to the stretch exponential. So what we find that they are uh, in reasonably good agreement, the in-place volume that we get from RTA and the trans MPI, uh, we can get a, a decent handle on what we have in the stimulated reservoir volume. Okay, so uh, what about other DCA tools, decline current analysis tools in the system? Well, there are others, uh, one is the uh, so we already talked about stretched exponential and power law and, and ARPS. The other one that was done at uh, E.T. Austin is logistic growth. Again, it's empirical. So all the tools that we are talking about are empirical. And uh, I'll not bore you with all this uh, mumbo jumbo. What I'd like to do is give you a quick uh, overview of ARPS and and as you can see, for exponential decline, uh, in terms of dimensional scheme production at time, it becomes flat. So you know it's, it's terminal. So whereas ARPS, anything greater than one, B of greater than one, will, will have in, uh, the solution doesn't have a closure. So it is always going to give you optimistic. So remember, if we have the flow totally dominated by linear flow, so B is two, so that will be really sky high. So whereas the stretch exponential, if we have a certain value, um, such as 0.3, and uh, so we will have a closure here, closure in solution. So that is why stretch exponential or power law exponential will always give you a more realistic solution. Okay, so here's the series model that uh, I alluded to, uh, developed at uh, UT Austin. In recent times, and see 2016. So what we are assuming in this model is that we have a uh, dual porosity system and the, uh, the these are the micro seismic that we're showing you, and I'll show you in the next picture uh, to give you a physical perspective. So we have a second order equation for uh, uh, part of PDE, or should we, for matrix and fracture. That's all we need to know. And then we are solving it. So in terms of physical system, what we have is in the fracture itself, so we have one linear flow and then the matrix begins to feed that. So if we have a dual process system and it can be uh, uh, what you call is the discrete fracture network, however way the, the, the matrix is stimulated, naturally speaking, then this modeling approach uh, works uh, rather well. So let me give you a quick example. So before we do that, 
So we tried to validate our solution and uh, analytical or semi-analytical solution with a numerical model. So here is the, the quality of agreement, as you can see. So this is the, the initial flow period, which is uh, basically governed by either bilinear or linear flow. And then we have a point of inflection, that's important. So if I have production history that shows this production and uh, this point of inflection, then we can predict the rest. So that's something to keep in mind. So here's an example from Bakken. So as you can see, here's the production data. This is the uh, oil rate in green, and this is the well head pressure. So what we are seeing is that this is the uh, uh, quarter uh, slope, and then this is the, the quarter slope, this is the half slope, and that's the beginning of the inner slope. This one. And then they put the pump in. And that's why it's, you're getting a basically a flat uh, pressure response. So this is what I was alluding to in the previous slide, that we see a point of inflection. So once we are here, down in this domain, then we can have the ability to uh, project this performance. And we have worked with uh, some 80 plus wells and we have had uh, great uh, success. And so that's why we tend to uh, favor this tool because it is rooted in, in the analytics. The, in contrast, as you know, if we use the uh, power law exponential or stress exponential, even though you have the data, it will tend to be on the pessimistic side. So whereas ARPS in the, is in the optimistic side and the power law and stress exponential appear to be on the pessimistic side, this tool gives you something, a solution, something uh, that is in between. So here's a, another example showing the same thing. We have the half slope line and followed by unit slope, very well defined unit slope response. And uh, again, we can project the rest of the behavior, uh, we think that fairly well. Okay, so as I said at the outset that we have many, many uh, wells, hundreds of wells in a given setting, uh, how about try to uh, group them. So there are many ways to skin the cat, as they say. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't have time for all of them, so I'll just share one that we have found uh, very uh, useful. So before I show that, uh, let me uh, share some of the studies that are out there, which uh, we are not involved in. but. Uh, so one thing that comes clear, regardless of the, uh, uh, the basin or the play, is the back end. Okay, so as the production period increases, the our ability to get a reasonable EOR improves. I mean that is consistent with uh, common sense logic. Uh, the longer the production history, the closer we are in predicting the remaining life. So that you're seeing same for Barnett and Woodford and Eagleford and so on. And uh, uh, so this study is, is showing, I said, okay, how do we uh, pass the hurdle for the SEC so as you can see, for the Burnett play, we have uh, the uh, exponential. So exponential will always give you very, very uh, uh, pessimistic solution. Uh, you really don't want to do that. Uh, you are under really underselling your uh, capability. So hyperbolic or ARPS uh, hyperbolic by definition would be uh, uh, it. it uh, it should be, uh, uh, we should call it ARPS. Anyway, be that as it may, so as you can see, it's a red uh, sign here because uh, the red light stems from the simple fact that it will be very optimistic. And uh, 
So it's getting red in most cases, and here is yellow. A modified hyperbolic, so you have to change the, the B factor arbitrarily at certain uh, point and it's uh, producing life. And that can be a challenge. So whereas power law or, or stretch exponential, you are getting mostly greens. And uh, according to these authors. Uh, Duong is not doing too badly. Uh, initially, it will be, see the early time data, if we have very short production period, it will be optimistic. But uh, then when you modify that again, uh, the tool, you get a more uh, acceptable solution. And basically for the Bakken, the same story is repeated. Um, hyperbolic is a no-no, as you can see, red light everywhere. And uh, power low and, and, and uh, modified uh, straight exponential are more reasonable. Okay, so um, even if you do this in some of the backcasting, so in other words, you hide uh, production, let's say we have this kind of uh, production uh, history. So we hide um, for three years and we want to see how good the tools are. So then we forecast and then we reveal. So we check, check it out. So if this kind of solution uh, can be obtained with any of these tools, then that will be uh, highly appreciated. That's what we're looking for. Okay. So, so this study entail uh, 5,000 wells from these uh, plays. And so what they found, for example, in the Bakken, and they tried different tools like ARPS, Duong, and, uh, and then what they're seeing, showing you is the, uh, the solution here. And uh, so I, I'm not sure why the ARPS is showing the uh, such a low uh, profile here, but uh, that's uh, sort of interesting. And uh, so I would think that uh, they modified ARPS, and that's why this is uh, coming up to be on the low side of the equation. So this is for the, uh, and this is if you start with the linear and then this is the boundary boundary flow. So we should always work with the boundary boundary flow. Otherwise we are not really ready to do anything uh, useful if we are not uh, in the boundary boundary flow period. So that's the bottom line. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is the, okay, how do you group oils? Because you just saw in previous slides that uh, we may have, have to deal with hundreds of oils. Again, I think most of the slides we have a reference at the bottom of the page. So what we said is, okay, um, we have to have oils of similar characteristics. Uh, so how do you define it? So we said, okay, how about PI? So right over pressure drop, right? Initial pressure mass, level pressure. But in, as you know, in unconventional play, we more often than not, we don't have, have that information. And flowing bottom pressure is not so bad um, for gas wells, because you have oil at pressure, you can always convert it, gas or gas condensate. But for oil, uh, before they set in the pump, you have that information. And otherwise, it would be very difficult. But this is unknown. So we said, okay, because all wells are, you know, of course, there are exceptions, but most wells are produced at their wells uh, capacity. So why not use rate alone? So if you do, try to do that, and this is a particular field data set, and then what we can do is that look at the year. Uh, this is uh, monthly production uh, profile. And um, so we can then begin to group them. And this is just an illustration, so don't take it literally. And uh, we can 
And rather than getting four groups, we can get more granularity as needed. So in this case, so this is a Barnett uh, trail examples with comprising 500 wells. And uh, so we pretended that only 18 months of uh, production was known um, because we are doing behind casting. So when we did that, and here's a particular well, uh, and we found that yes, when we do that, the uh, is within the uncertainty limit of our um, modeling approach. So now you might ask or wonder, is it okay, we probably picked a one, Sherry picked something that looks very good. Well, um, I'll show you. So, so these uh, 40 uh, plus wells in the part of the wells uh, in that uh, Burnett. So what we are looking at is the, uh, uh, the, the green bars, vertical bars that you are looking at is the uncertainty range. So we, we frame the problem in a, in a probabilistic way. And the red arrows that you see, they are reflection of where a given well fall, performance falls within that uncertainty band. So as you can see, in most cases we're doing okay, but in some cases we can be off. Uh, like in this case, or in this case, we are barely there. So we did that for uh, multiple plays. Uh, for example, uh, Marcellus, we have 224. And as you can see, uh, we can be off here and there. This guy is way off, I admit. And this is for the uh, Elm Cooley, tight oil, 400 wells. And Here's the spread. So, so here's the summary. As you can see, that uh, for most of the time, you might say 75% of the time, we are able to capture the performance within our uh, P10 to P90 uh, probability. And the rest, uh, some are above that and some are below that. And uh, so that's the spread. Now, this is a direct function of the, of the grouping that we perform. So we can narrow it down further by uh, getting more granularity in grouping. So let me then summarize what we have been uh, talking about. So what we found that uh, the, some of the empirical tools that we have been using as in the industry, uh, which were introduced in the context of gas, uh, appeared to work uh, just as well for tight oil. Here, the difference is nano versus micro. And we are not sure when we initiated our investigation that that would be possible. And as you saw, that we are able to estimate when you, whenever we have uh, bottom hole pressure data, or if we convert wallet pressure to bottom hole, then we can get the uh, estimation of the stimulated reservoir volume. And uh, we can also estimate the expected ultimate recovery. So this is something that we are excited about, the so-called series analytical model. Uh, we have verified a numerical model and validated it with uh, plenty of field data. And because it has uh, rooted in physics, it seems to uh, be doing uh, fairly well. And uh, again, we just touched on it. Uh, how we can go about grouping wells. And uh, it is entirely possible. And uh, so the, the approach that we took in our study appears to be, uh, uh, we did fairly well. We are pleased with that. And certainly uh, if we had taken 
um, finer granularity, if you like, uh, in terms of the which wells belong to uh, which group, then we can we could have improved the outcome much better. But as is, we're uh, we're quite pleased with our initial effort. Thank you for attention. With that, I conclude my talk and I'll be open for uh, taking some questions. Great. Well, as we're waiting for some of the questions to come in, I want to remind our audience today that this is an excerpt of uh, one of the classes that Shaka Kabir teaches for SCA. It's Reservoir Management of Unconventional Reservoirs from Inception to Maturity. It's offered uh, the first time next year in February, February 7th and 8th in Houston. And for those of you who are attending today, you will uh, receive a recording of uh, today's webinar, an evaluation form, and a link to details about that class. Uh, so we look forward to receiving your feedback. Um, we've had a number of um, uh, webinars, and this is a great opportunity for you to get a sample of, of some of the classes that we offer. Um, Shaw, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, the grouping of wells? Um, when you're binning wells like this, how many wells do you need to have together for it to be statistically appropriate in one group? Yeah, I think um, it is, that's a very good question. It is basically driven by the, uh, if I may uh, show this as an example, like we are, uh, we grouped all of these uh, into one. So in this case, as you can see, we just did a four, because we are trying to learn uh, only four groups. And that's probably uh, unwise. I, we could have moved, for example, so can you see my? Yes. Uh, OK. So for example, I would move these two guys to that group, for example. So what we are basing on is the, um, what metric do we use? So what we are basing on is the, uh, uh, the rates, the daily production rate. And uh, as you know, that can be a function of so many things. Uh, obviously the intrinsic rock properties and the and most, and most importantly, the stimulation and uh, so we have a number of uh, fracture stages uh, that are in play and on and on so I think for let's say we know if you have 500 wells to deal with we can start somewhere and then uh, we can get go into more uh, granularity here we we're just trying to illustrate and said, hey, uh, so even if we go with four groups for this 65 wells, we appear to uh, be doing all right. Uh, could we improve it further? Of course. But that was just the, uh, uh, we were trying to learn uh, what to do because when you're dealing with public database, we didn't have access to all the completion uh, information and uh, on and on. So we had to guess a uh, lot of those uh, elements. And uh, uh, but but if you're operating a given uh, given field, then you have a lot more insight, a lot more information from data frequency to uh, completion types to fluids used and, and uh, on and on. Uh, so that those, uh, that kind of uh, body of information can be brought to bear to, uh, to gain a lot more insights and, and help us uh, do it. Okay, so um, 
another question on the chart where you had the um, the stoplight chart where you had the red, yellow, and green for the different okay. uh, uh, analysis tools. It it looks like that in some cases uh, you favored some of the tools over others, and it seemed to vary by formation. Um, I, I think you had Barnett, and then you had another uh, formation, Bakken. Thank you. And right. and so to um, do this type of analysis, how many uh, wells do you need to validate uh, before you can um, use that throughout that particular formation? Um. I think uh, these authors had used a, uh, uh, I think they had, statistically speaking, sufficient number of wells to uh, come to this sort of uh, a decision in uh, what they are showing with the traffic light. I may have a little bit of qualms here and there, but in general, what they have, what they're showing is uh, is uh, I have uh, uh, complete agreement with that. Uh, for example, if we have, um, if you're trying to be compliant with the SEC, yeah, so, and you use the exponential decline, you'll get the uh, lowest of low uh, in place volume or the uh, EOR, expected ultimate recovery estimation. So yeah, SEC will always agree with you, but that's not your best interest if you're the operator. Um, so, but beyond that, if you look at the, uh, what I would say, a power law or, or state exponential, yeah, either one will give you a very, very, um, similar solution. And uh, as far as the number of wells and all that, I think uh, it all depends on uh, the number of wells uh, you as the operator uh, are dealing with and their production history. So that is a key that if we have, let's say for uh, sake of conversation, if we only have three months production history and, uh, and that is to happen to us. Our management will say, hey, okay, the well just came on and uh, tell me it's uh, expected recovery in 30 or 40 years down the road. Um, I don't think you can do that. Or I don't know if any tool that can do it with uh, any credibility. So once we are able to establish that and say, okay, what kind of production history we have, then it's a lot easier to uh, 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 so we, uh, you can hang your head on that. I said, okay, yeah, I can, I, I have enough confidence that uh, we should be able to project its performance. And we're making a lot of implicit assumptions that look, uh, there is not you no know, uh, infill drilling will occur here. Uh, there will be no uh, frack hits, which can impede its uh, performance significantly. And all the completions that we did, uh, the, both in terms of propens and everything, will maintain its uh, their identity, on and on. So, so therein lies the uncertainty that okay. How long can we realistically project this uh, performance for? 10 years, 15 years? Or that. But going to 30 or 40 years will be uh, overly optimistic in my book. So I think you mentioned yeah. briefly that uh, the stretch exponential was uh, verified by CRM. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, stretch exponential, uh, no, I said, um, the, the, um, the series model. Ah, okay. Yeah, the series model, so the this series guy, analytical, uh, right. Right, so this is analytical, 
and we verified with the uh, numerical uh, tool. Uh, I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. So you can see that they uh, overlay uh, completely, and uh, and the solution that we we obtained was uh, uh, semi-analytical to be to be precise. So that's why we say approximate analytical. I didn't want to point out uh, uh, all the gory details, but uh, that's that's what it is. And uh, so that's why I would put my money on this guy uh, among the original tools. So that's an area where you're seeing some continuing work in the series analytical models? Um, hopefully, uh, people will uh, pick it up and uh, and work uh, work with it. Uh, it. It just came out last year, 2016, and uh, more more work to be done in that area. Well, those are all the yeah. questions that we've received today from our audience. So I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And later today, you'll get a link to the recording of the webinar with an evaluation form and registration details about the class that Shaw will be teaching in February on reservoir management of unconventional reservoirs from the inception to maturity. That's February 7th and 8th in Houston, Texas. Uh, Thanks to everyone for participating today, and we look forward to seeing you in a future webinar.